bags down, spikes on. Welcome to the track. My name is Colin Waitsman, going to be your host for this episode of Track World News. And we had a big weekend in the collegiate realm, so we have a lot of stuff we're going to go through. Let's, so let's get right into it. Uh, but first, make sure that you leave a review, uh, a rating, subscribe, uh, and follow the show on Instagram. Uh, really helps us know that you're enjoying what's going on and uh, love the support there. Okay, uh, now let's get into it. Uh, first, before we get into the college realm, of things we have to talk about in extremely, extremely good performance that came in the middle of the week uh, from Grant Holloway. So if you've been living under a rock in the track and field realm for the past couple of years, uh, Grant Holloway is one of, if not the greatest hurdler uh, around right now. Short sprints hurdler, 110 and 60 meter hurdles. And he just broke uh, the world record in the 60-meter hurdles, running 729. And I believe he's only 23, 22 years old. So extremely impressive because the guy who he broke, uh, Colin something, can't remember, Colin Jackson maybe? Uh, he was in his late 20s, I believe, when he broke it. So he's already showing that he's got really great top end potential especially in the the shorter the shorter hurdles and not only did he break the world record but there is so much more behind his story of his hurdling career that people don't know uh so Grant Holloway has ran in 47 hurdle races in his entire career so that's including prelims finals championships semis all that stuff. He's ran in 47 of them. And in those 47 races, he has won every single race. He has been so dominant. We we have not seen this amount of dominance in track and field. Well, actually, I was going to say in a long time, but we saw it recently with Usain Bolt and with how he was just super dominant in the 100 over the over the short distance and in the olympics but we but he wasn't like this he wasn't winning every single race that he ever competed in he was winning winning when it counted at the olympics but he wasn't winning every single race he had lost a few world championships here and there and the fact that grant holloway is doing this is extraordinarily impressive especially when we are starting to see a lot of fantastic hurdlers uh, around and the fact that you don't even lose like a prelim race you just won every single time you're on the line uh that's that's extraordinary i mean i i looking back at my previous episode of who will be the face of track and field um if i were to edit that list today uh, i'm sure we're gonna make a little edit of that as after the Olympics to, to, so we'll do an update. But right now, I mean, Grant Holloway's right up there. Uh, he, he has potential to be the, the face of track and field, uh, if not now, uh, pretty soon, because he is dominating. He's dominating in the hurdles and he is really exciting to watch. And he can also do other stuff. Like he's probably has a, a good potential at being in the four by four and maybe, Maybe the four by one. I mean, I know that there's a lot of people that want to see, me included, want to see uh, Noah Lyles, Michael Norman, um, uh, Grant Holloway, and uh, Rye Benjamin, four by two or four by four. That would be extremely impressive uh, and just something really cool. I think they have great chemistry. But yeah, he's he's just doing amazing. Um, looking, f and it was on his last meet of the indoor season. So looking forward to seeing how he does for outdoors as we go over there. Really great competitor. Uh, seems like a super nice guy. If you've seen some interviews that he's done and, and things like that, really humble, but also extraordinarily competitive. So great person to have in the sport and great personality to have here. So uh, fantastic. Um, now I want to talk about uh, a few of the. I was going to, before we talk about the conference championships and my predictions that I had last week, how I did, how I didn't do. Uh, I want to talk about another performance that is probably going to go unnoticed for most, but especially because of the timing, really want to talk about it. So just recently, last 
my, my last episode, so if you haven't listened to it yet, go check it out. Uh, it's an interview with uh, Trevor Bassett. He's a hurdler and sprinter from Ashland University. And so for those that don't know, Ashland is a Division II school, one of the best in the country, if not the best in the country. And he's really, really fast. <laughs> like, he's not just D2 fast, because people think, oh, if you're Division II, you're just, you're not as fast as Division I, which I've talked about also, uh, that you don't need to go Division I to be a, a successful athlete. And uh, he is putting up insane times. This past weekend was their conference championships, and he was putting up dumb, crazy numbers. Now, let, when I tell you what these numbers are, these rankings are not rankings in Division II. These are rankings in all of the collegiate system, so including Division I athletes. So he ran a 20.4 in the 200, which is number five in the NCAA. He ran a 45. 27 in the 400, which is number six in the NCAA. And then he also ran a 7.67 in the 60 meter hurdles, which is tied for sixth in the NCAA. There's no one else really that is showing that versatility in college right now. He is showing that he is an extraordinarily good athlete and is deserving of being in the Bowerman conversation. We talked about it in our previous interview. Uh, yeah, he was a little upset that he wasn't getting the recognition that he deserves. And I mean, this weekend shows that he deserves to be in that conversation. When you're you're putting up numbers that are the top in the country, you're, you're, you're nearly top five in three different events. That's Bowerman recognition worthy because I guarantee you if he went to a bigger school, uh, you know, one of the blue chip programs, I guarantee you that he would be on that Bowerman watch list. And now I hope to see that he will be next time they have a watch list. Uh, I think it's sometime after outdoors. They don't do it like every other week, but uh, sometimes after indoor, sorry. Um, so hopefully that'll come up because very, very impressive performance. And if you want to hear more about his story, go listen to his interview. Uh, it is uh, called... Um, you know, interview with uh, with Trevor Bassett, so very impressive. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at the conference championships for reviews. So, um, for those that know, we we did a review or a preview of our the conference championships last week, uh, talking about who I think who I thought was going to win, uh, who was going to be the runner up, and I think I also mentioned maybe who who I thought might have had some some good performances, and and there was a lot. There's a lot that. That happened. So we're just going to do a brief overview of, of all of them. Uh, first, so let's take a review on on how I actually did. Uh, guessing. So I got of what I did was I said who I thought was going to win and who I thought was going to be the runner up in each conference. So I only did the Power Five. So uh, ACC, Big Twelve, Big Ten, SEC, and Pac Twelve didn't have indoors uh, indoor conference championships. So um, just skip that. Uh, so out of the 16 guesses, I got six exactly right. So that I got were champions and, and runner-ups. Of the just people that I got that were in the top two, so if I said they were runner-up but they actually won, or if I said they were going to win and they were the runner-up, just I I mentioned them. I got nine out of six, nine out of 16. Better, a uh, little over, a uh, little over half. And then what I did really well in was the conference, who I thought was going to be the conference champions. And I got six out of eight of the conference champions there. So not too shabby. Um, thought I could have done a little bit better, especially on the, the exactly right ones. But we take what we can get. So uh, looking at it, uh, ACC, Virginia Tech won North Carolina runner-up for the men. Florida State uh, winners, Miami runner-up for the women. Uh, Big 12, Texas took both of them for men's and women's. Texas Tech men came in second. Oklahoma State came in second for the women. Big 10, Iowa uh, came home with the championship. Indiana, the runners-up. Minnesota won it for the women, followed by Michigan. And then for the SEC, Arkansas men and women both took it. And then LSU runners-up for the men and Florida runners-up for the women. So uh, very, I mean, uh, we saw some pretty standard ones. I mean, it's it's almost if you guessed chalk for, for the conference champions, it was it was pretty good. But there was still a lot of great performances that, that we saw. And so a few that, that really 
really stood out to me. Uh, Aething Moo, uh, once again, just, just being incredibly dominant <laughs> like she is. She ran a, a 158.40 uh, collegiate record um, and the U20 world indoor record. And also, not only that, if you take the times of, I think it's like your, your pairing of your 400 and your 800 and, and you see, and like you add those times together or whatever, uh, it's the second best 400-800 combo of all time indoors, no matter the age. So she's showing to be extremely dominant, especially as a freshman. I'm like, I keep forgetting that she's just a freshman and she's putting up these times. Like this first year collegiate uh, in, you know, running these times as a collegian, Great, just doing really well. Uh, there's a huge, a very bright future uh, for middle distance, especially uh, Texas A&M. Uh, SEC should be should be very impressive the next few years. Then uh, I also saw out of the SEC, uh, Terrence Laird. Uh, have a little bias because he's uh, he's from the same district that I am. He's a District One uh, Coatesville uh, alumni. Uh, ran a 20.28 collegiate. Uh, lead in the 200 uh beating Matthew Bowling um who I thought was was going to be was going to win. He he had an impressive day himself uh with the 200. I think he set a PR uh in the long jump with a uh, you know jumping like fifth is what he got. Uh, so but Terrence Laird um great to see that that he's doing well. He's went to a few different schools uh now. I think this is and you know, he's found a a great place and a great program here with LSU hoping to see him thrive. Uh, Cause he's doing, he's doing fantastic. And then um, last um, performance that really impressed me was the Tennessee's four by four. They ran a world lead of a 304.08. Uh, another just great time. Uh, if you didn't, if you missed it, talk to their sprints coach actually a few weeks ago. Uh, and they, and he talked about, you know, what they have to do to be able to win a, a national championship. And, and by putting up times like this, I mean, that's how you do it. Uh, Tennessee's really starting to prove themselves as a program. Uh, one of the top programs in the country, especially as of late. And so looking forward to seeing how they're, they're going to do, um, going into this national championship. I mean, there's a lot of teams that, that I think can win, uh, and there's a lot of teams that, you know, have potential to, to be in that conversation and they're one of them. Uh, so looking forward to seeing, you know, how that's going to go uh, and, and getting, you know, getting into that, let's take a look at my final, uh, my final power rankings for the NCAA. So going into the conference championship, which isn't this week, it's, it's next week, um, these are these are what I have as the power rankings, and then I'll, I'll also talk about who I think will will actually win in my my predictions there. So, uh, on the men's side, we're going to go through the top eight here. Uh, we have number one Oregon, number two LSU, number three BYU, number four Florida State University, uh, number five Georgia, number six Florida, number seven Texas, and number eight. NC A and T North Carolina A and T, and so I think uh, the the team that that sh is going to win this and and they really should uh, will be Oregon. Uh, they they just have a super a super dominant team uh, this year. They really have got a lot of depth, uh, so I think they have a, a good shot at really taking home uh, the championship. LSU though did surprise me. They they've got a very good mixture of sprints and jumps uh, that can tie into and take a few points away from Oregon, especially since their sixty is uh, is doing really well. Uh, the guy what he ran a six forty nine I believe last week, uh, this past week, and of course their their distance is unmatched. I mean no no team's gonna beat them in the mile. No team's gonna gonna beat them in the the eight. They've got the three best runners in the nation plus a, a, a war chest of other great runners underneath them. So they, they I think they're going to win it. Um, I don't want to, you know, go, go straight chalk, but I'm saying LSU probably will take second. Then I think Florida State's going to hop uh, BYU and then Georgia and then maybe BYU after that. So uh, the men's side, a lot of great teams. I think Oregon, though, is kind of the clear consensus uh, for this. So um, we'll see um, who, who's going to end up taking that. Then on the women's side, we've seen 
actually quite a bit of changes, uh, especially up here at the top. So looking at the, the top eight performances, um, over my power rankings, who I got top eight, number one, Texas A&M, number two, Texas, number three, Arkansas, number four, Georgia, number five, BYU, number six, LSU, number seven, Texas Tech, number eight, Florida. So actually a lot of the same, uh, same programs uh, for the men and for the women just shows you how uh, dominant many of these programs are on both sides. It's not a just a, a male program that's doing well, not just a female program that's doing well. Most of these have a lot of overlap. Uh, and I think that uh, while Texas A&M I have winning I think that, or is number one, I, I'm going to go with the upset. I'm going to say Texas is, is going to end up, actually, no. Yeah, let's say Texas. I bet you Texas is going to end up winning. Uh, Texas A&M will probably come second. Arkansas will will come third. It's going to be those three teams that are that are winning it. Uh, you could really you could say any of the three, and I would believe you. But those are going to be the three that are fighting for it. Uh, I like. I mean, I don't want Arkansas to win. I don't know why. Like I've had this like <laughs> I just don't want Arkansas to win because I think their team's just so dominant, and so um, I would like to see another team another team beat them. But Arkansas just has a ton of depth, and they they can sneak a few points in at a whole lot of competition. So the, of these other teams that, you know, like Texas A&M and, and, and Texas, where they might have multiple people that are, that are qualifying, or they might be, they might have a few people that are high on the rankings. Uh, Arkansas has a lot of people that might be a little lower on the rankings. And so if, you know, a Texas A&M or a Texas, they have a, a runner or an athlete that slips a little bit, that can open the door up pretty wide for Arkansas. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be a scrap for who it is that's going to take that championship. But yeah, I'm going to say Texas uh, is going to take the national championship for the indoor season on the women's side. So overall, I mean, I think it, it's going to be exciting. This upcoming week, not a lot of things are, are going on, at least on the collegiate level. Uh, there definitely will be a few meets going on professionally. I know for pole vault, I'm going to be super excited. Uh, Renault, he jumped 606 this past week, and we're going to have Mondo Duplantis. I believe he's running or vaulting next week as well. So there should be a couple good, couple good meets there. Um, also, oh yeah, one other one that we'd like to cover, uh, the Texas Qualifier. Uh, super exciting to see that um, podcast host of the Citus Mag, what, Chris Chavez, he was the announcer for that meet. Um, it was it was nice to see. Focus mainly on on distance, uh, which was cool. Uh, had some had some really good performances, even though a few athletes had you know a little bit of adverse weather. But you know it was nice, and it was it was also really great to see. And they they poked fun of it on uh, on their social media that is a track meet that is not you don't have to pay to watch because so many of these meets are. You have to pay to watch it, and it's super annoying when you have a lot of people that are just trying to watch track and field. And so it was nice to see it be live stream for free, and and pretty good competition, and and pretty good announcers as well. So uh, overall, uh, exciting week. Uh, looking forward to seeing what's going to happen for the NCAs. We also have cross country championship, which is the same weekend, which is that's just going to be wild. I feel, and uh, yeah, overall uh, should be exciting, but. Thank you all for listening. This has been another episode of Track World News. Um, make sure that you follow, subscribe, leave a rating and a review. Uh, really helps us know that you're enjoying what's going on. Uh, my name's Colin. Have a good one and peace.